We are in a collection around here entitled Dating Delilah. And we are studying the biblical character known as Samson. Samson was uh, an Israelite judge whose call from God was to deliver his people who were oppressed by a pagan people known as Philistine. Uh, unfortunately for Samson, his problem is, is that he loves the very thing that God has called him to deliver others from. How y'all know it's hard to defeat darkness when you're dating darkness? And if you've ever heard the name Samson, I've learned a lot over the last few weeks that a lot of people know a little about Samson. But more often than not, if you've heard the name Samson, you've heard another name, that is the name Delilah. Samson's name, uh, literally defined, means sunlight or sunny, if you will. Delilah, the first part of her name means temptress or temptation, and the back end of her name means of the night. So we see a contrast of, of night versus light or good versus evil. And although we haven't even met Delilah yet in the text, that's gonna be the next three Sundays in a row, starting next week, Judges chapter 16, it is clear to all of us that Samson has been stumbling in the darkness. And last week, we studied Judges chapter 14. If you can remember it, he goes to enemy's territory, Philistine territory, to an area known as Timna. He sees a girl there that's a Philistine. He wants her, he desires her. He convinces his parents to co-sign uh, this sinful act. And then the end of the chapter ends with him being so fixated on his flesh that he gets so angry the Bible says that he loses a bet to 30 guys. Because he loses the bet, he goes to another town, kills 30 dudes, but the text ends saying that he burned with anger. So he went from fixation to fury. Now we're gonna step into chapter 15, and I gotta be honest with you, just, I'm just kinda giving some precursors here. Chapter 15 is full of betrayal, battles, and some of the most b bizarre behavior you've ever seen. Uh, a lot of interesting things in the Bible. Chapter 15 is one of those weird chapters in the Bible. So buckle up, because it's gonna get interesting. But underneath all of the drama, I believe there is an underlying question that we must answer as we're in part three of our collection. And, and that is, what do I do when winning leaves you empty? What do you do when, when winning leaves you in an empty place? Have you ever been there before that you're accomplishing the things that you're attempting to accomplish? You're looking victorious on the outside, but on the inside you're dying? You ever wanted something so bad then you finally got it only to go, that didn't fulfill me at all. I could give a lot of examples, I'm a preacher, but let's just try to bring everyone into the talk today. Uh, I think we've all been there, it's around 2 a.m., you're driving home and then all of a sudden you see it. You, you know you shouldn't look in that direction but you see those two golden arches and you say, I gotta have it. <laughs> I'm 40 years of age and I, I know it's wrong, I know my body can't handle it. <laughs> My mind's telling me no, but my body, yeah. My, <laughs> and I find myself getting off of US-1 and no one's around, no one's looking, but I find myself in that McDonald's drive through And although I haven't visited many times, it's like it's just default in my body. I come up to the cash register, I say number two, plain meat and cheese, large Coke, McFlurry, hey, for good measure, why not add in an apple pie? What was that, supersize? Yes, I think I will. <laughs> and then like a real life addict, I'm in the parking lot stuffing my face. And that slogan is going off in my mind, have it your way. <laughs> but the word of God already tells us that sin is pleasurable for a season. And man, at 40 years of age, that McDonald's tastes good going down. But fast forward 20 minutes, there is something in my stomach. It feels like a boulder, but even with it, quickly, I don't know if you're like me, I, I have regret. There's a little bit of shame. What am I doing out here at two in the morning? It hits you. Maybe having it my way is the wrong way. And all of us have come to that place before where it's like, am I really going to live my life just having it my way? Today, as we get into Judges chapter 15, this is Samson, he's always getting it his way. And even on the outside, at times, it looks like he's winning, but it always leaves him more empty than how he started. 15 picks up that Samson has just 
killed 30 men. He's burning with anger. And now chapter 15 begins, it just says, sometime later, Samson went back to his wife's house. This is the woman that he was marrying in chapter 14. And when he gets there, the father of the bride will not let him into the house. Let's pick it up. This is verse two. Watch this. The dad says, I was so sure that you hated her. He said that I gave her to your companion. Isn't her younger sister more attractive? Take her instead. Samson said to them, this time I have a right. If you got your Bible there, underline that. I have a right to get even with the Philistines. I will really harm them. So he went out and caught 300 foxes, tied them tail to tail in pairs. He then fastened a torch to every pair of tails lit the torches, and let the foxes loose in standing grain of the Philistines. He burned up the shocks and standing grain together with the vineyards and olive groves. First observation, unmanaged anger becomes destructive. Now. now, if you've been following along in Samson's story, Samson is being driven by this underneath current of a burning anger. I, I mentioned last week, and I want to kind of bring some qualification why I want to lean on this because I think anger is one of these emotions that doesn't get talked about enough. We all have emotions. There is no emotion that's evil in and of itself. Emotions are valid. Just emotion should not be the thing that drives your life. This is a negative emotion. We oftentimes get angry because we feel some sort of ex existential threat or we feel out of control or we feel a lack of injustice. And so many people, they don't realize that the thing that's binding them up in life, this entire collection is about you finding freedom in your everyday life, you being delivered, not just getting to heaven, but walking free here on earth. And many of you, you don't even pay attention to it, but the thing that has you bound today, actually at the root of it, is anger. Some of you, you, you struggle so deeply, even as a follower of Jesus, with like crippling anxiety. Where does anxiety come from? Many times we're so afraid of the future, we feel so threatened by what's out there that we're angry and it leaves us in this place that we're thin and anxious. Others of you, you love Jesus, you can't wait to heaven, but you go through all of life with this doom and gloom mentality. You're what psychologists would say, you are depressed. But what is depression? Depression is an inner anger that I have no outlet, therefore it's just a matter of time before I have an outburst. Others of us, we can't find relief, we can't find peace. And so all I know to do is go to the bottle, go to drugs, go to sex, go to power. It's called addiction. Now, I don't know what negative emotion has your life. What I do believe is this. Pete Scazzaro, the great author, he says it this way. You will never be spiritually mature until you're first emotionally mature. So a lot of churches will try to teach you. Well, let me take that back. I don't like that. Sometimes people will teach you just pray more, shout louder, dance, and have a spiritual victory. I believe in spiritual victories, but God tends to bless good stewards, people who become aware of their faults, their weaknesses, those that confront the real things going on. And God is saying, I want to mature you, but if you don't pay attention to the things beneath the surface, if you don't start fighting back against the negative emotions that are driving your life, you will never walk into maturity. So I, I, just, I just wanna see this because I don't know if it's anger for you, but a lot of us in this place, we keep getting driven by a negative emotion and the result, even though we're winning on the outside, we're dying on the inside. So watch this. He shows up at the father of the bride's house. I just want you to see this, because this is a picture of an addict, by the way. Samson wakes up, it's a few days later, whew, I've cooled down now, I'm gonna go see my wife. And the dad's like, whoa, 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 no, bro. The way you behaved, the way you behaved, I thought you hated her. There was no way I could have ever believed that you loved her. Anyone who's ever dealt with somebody who struggles with addiction, or you yourself if you struggle with addiction, there is this dichotomy about what I believe and what I feel versus how I actually come off. In fact, some of us, we can't even see the red flags in our life, we need other people to pinpoint those. You ever try to tell an alcoholic who hasn't actually admitted they're an alcoholic, you got a drinking problem? Oh, no, I don't. No, I'm good. No, man, you don't know how you're coming off. The thing that you say you love, we actually think you hate. It's called the di disintegration of the soul. His soul is disintegrating in front of our eyes. Now watch this man. This man is so angry, it's this unmanaged anger, and unmanaged anger always becomes destructive. He says, now I have a right to get even. I have a right to make them pay. My man goes and finds 300 foxes. How mad you gotta be <laughs> to, 
to find 300 fox. Who has ever said, you know what? I know the solution to my problem. See that fox? I'm going to get 300. I'm going to tie them up. 150 ties he has to do. And then I'm going to take this anger that's burning on me and I'm going to let it manifest. I'm going to light their tail. This is a pyromaniac if I ever saw one. This isn't just anger. This is creative insanity. I've gotten mad before, but I haven't ever gotten so, you know, tie foxes up mad. This is such anger. The fox is like, yo, bro, maybe you should just breathe this for a moment. Take a breath. Like, chill out. Think about the effort. You ever get mad and like you get hot and then like 30 minutes you're like, whoa, that was kind of crazy. You kind of come down. This dude's like, no. How, how many hours? I mean, honestly, this is like a week's project. What's driving him? It's an unmanaged anger that is now becoming so destructive. How is it being destructive? He's trying to seek vengeance. Funny, Samson's a judge. You know what a judge's responsibility is? To deliver justice, not seek vengeance. Big difference. Vengeance is all about personal payback birthed out of anger. Justice is all about a principled accountability structure based on fairness. Vengeance seeks to torture. Justice seeks to correct. Vengeance wants to hurt. Justice wants to help. And here's the lie of revenge. The lie of revenge is, is that it never satisfies you. They hurt you, so now you want to gossip about them. They left you and now you want to make them pay. And in making them pay, you never find the fulfillment or the satisfaction. And the real part about revenge is that it's a downward spiral. Yeah. Because one act of vengeance just begets another act of vengeance. I'm not trying to weigh into geopolitics, but what do you think has been happening with Israel in the Middle East all these years? It's one act of vengeance against another act of vengeance. Everyone says they want justice, but in many times they just want vengeance. Wow. Now watch this. This is big because this is not the value system of the kingdom of God. Look at what Romans chapter 12 says. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. That's a bar for some of y'all. Because next time you want to go off, just go, you know what? I got to leave room for God's wrath. Some of y'all trying to do God's job. Let God have the final say. For it is written. Guess where this is written? This is written in the book of Deuteronomy. Guess who studied the book of Deuteronomy? Samson, he's a judge. So this is coming from the Old Testament. It is mine to avenge and I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. You want revenge? Okay, it's called righteous revenge. Righteous revenge is this. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Jesus offers us a greater principle. It's called the principle of forgiveness. What is the value of forgiveness? Come on, somebody. It is peace and peace more abundantly. Anybody grateful that God has a pathway to peace? Well, my man burns their fields down with foxes. Well, they go back and get their vengeance. They find his wife and father and they burn them alive. And Gandhi, although he wasn't a Christian, sometimes he preached Christianity better than some of us live it out. He says it this way. He says, an eye for an eye leaves the whole world blind. And it's this unmanaged anger that is destructive. But look what happens. Samson, he gets his revenge. They get the revenge. Now Samson, he goes on another terror, another act of vengeance. It says this in Judges chapter 15, verse 7. Samson said to them, since you've acted like this, I swear that I won't stop until I get my revenge on you. He attacked them viciously and slaughtered many of them. Then he went down, watch this, and stayed in a cave in the rock of Edom. What I want you to see that's so important in this text is that unchecked anger isolates. Unchecked anger isolates. He is winning, he's victorious, he's getting what he wants, he's doing it his way, and now in doing it his way, he is driven to a cave where he is living all alone. Unaddressed anger doesn't just burn bridges, it builds walls. And many of us today, we are living in a proverbial cave. It's a big deal because it's a dangerous place to be when you're angry. This past summer, I took my family on a summer vacation. I'm not recommending it. I'm not offering you vacation advice. I love Miami. I love the beaches. I just love our city. But somehow, 
Through an act of God, I found myself in Branson, Missouri. It's gorgeous, it's gorgeous. Um, m- m- misery, misery, I mean, m- Missouri, Missouri. <laughs> France and Missouri, Missouri, Missouri is how you say it. Uh, God bless all of our fine friends and family who watch from Missouri. But um, <laughs> we did not go to Disney World. No, 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 we went to a place about 20 steps below that in excellence and performance. That would be the Silver Dollar City, uh, a great theme park for kids that, once again, I would never recommend this to any of you. Um, <laughs> On the way out of the Silver Dollar City, there was this advertisement, come enjoy the fantastic caves. You know, I'm an adventurous guy, I said, let's do it. I I said, let's take the family into the belly of the cave. I wasn't completely prepared for what I was getting myself ready for. I was leaving sunlight to go enjoy stalactites. And as we made our way down 200 steps, there was two basic observations that I learned about caves that day. The first thing is, as we got into the cave, the guide turned all of the lights out. I'm talking about so dark that you can't see your hand in front of your face. Then he gave us an exercise. He gave us all something to shout aloud. And as we all in unison shouted aloud, about two to three seconds later, our voice echoed back at us. And I thought, what a dangerous place to be when you're angry is all alone in a cave. Because how many of y'all know darkness is disorienting? Some of you right now, you are living in darkness. You're seeing stuff that's not even there. You're feeling things that do not even actually exist. And what's even more dangerous than the darkness is the only voice you hear is yours. When you are angry, you don't want to be isolated. When you are going through a difficult time, you don't want to live in darkness. You don't want to listen to your echo. It's one of the great reasons why we come into God's house. We come into God's house because we sit under his word. His word is truth. His word is life. His word speaks into my situation. But not just that, the word of God is a light into my path. Jesus Christ himself is the light of the world. And when I find myself in a cave, I'm grateful for a guy named Jesus who says, you don't gotta stay there. I have a way to get you out of there. Somebody take a moment right now and thank God for the light of the world entering into your situation. Do not let your anger go unchecked because it isolates you. And it's a dangerous place for you to find yourself in. Here is Samson, all alone in the darkness, lying to himself. I got my vengeance, I'm winning, I'm the man, I got it my way. But the Bible says that the Philistine army, they come and they find Israel. In fact, they go to the tribe of Judah and they go to these men of Judah and say, yo, if you don't take care of Samson, we're gonna kill all of y'all. So 3,000 men from Judah, they march to that cave and they go and confront Samson. These are Samson's people. I think it's a very pivotal moment in Samson's story because I, I, I firmly believe this. I believe that unaddressed anger breeds resentment. Just imagine for a moment, because sometimes we just look at Samson and we just, it's just so easy to kind of poke holes at him and make fun of him, but let's just lean into his humanity for a moment. Can you imagine the very people that you're called to serve and protect are now betraying you? How do you think that feels? I actually believe this is a pivotal moment in the story of Samson, because I wonder, is this the moment that he stops just simply compromising his calling and he starts to hate his calling? Because some of you, you find yourself there right now. That people have let you down or betrayed you. Things that you know that you're called to. It's really hard to be a God-fearing, honoring wife when you feel constantly disrespected by your husband. It's hard to keep being a good dad in 2024 when all you seem to get from your children is disobedience. It's a tough spot to be, and if you're not careful, what will happen is that anger will breed into resentment, and listen to me loud and clear. Resentment and bitterness are enemies of love. You will never, ever live out your God calling and your purpose doing so from a place of resentment and bitterness. You need the love of God to be the change agent and the driving force. Look what happens. Judges chapter 15, here they come. This is the Israelites, the men of Judah. They said, we've come to tie you up and hand you over to the Philistines. And Samson said, swear to me that you won't kill me yourselves. Agreed, they answered. We will only tie you up 
and hand you over to them. We will not kill you. So they bound him with two new ropes and led him up from the rock. As he approached Lehi, the Philistines came toward him shouting. The spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him and the ropes on his arms became like charred flax and the bindings dropped from his hands. Watch this. Finding a fresh jawbone of a donkey, he grabbed it and struck down a thousand men. So get the picture. He's in this cave all alone. The men come and say, hey, uh, these people are gonna kill us if we don't turn you in. He's like, all right, don't you kill me and I'll actually follow you. So we promise we won't kill you. We'll just deliver you over to them. They put ropes on him. He's walking out in ropes and all of a sudden he's got 3,000 men of Judah behind him and he's got 1,000 Philistine soldiers in front of him. When he sees them, the spirit of God comes upon him in a powerful way that the ropes break off his wrist. He don't pick up a sword do don't get a spear, doesn't find a shield, there's no slingshot in the story. No, he grabs a fresh, I could preach that if we had more time. In fact, if you were here for the last past year, we don't need something new at Voo Church, but you need something fresh at Voo Church. He grabs a fresh jawbone of a donkey, and my man goes mortal combat Finish them, all 1,000, let the bodies hit the floor. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> I mean, he crushes them. How many of y'all know, sometimes you just got to work with what you got. Some of y'all think you need something new, you need to get some new job, got to get to some new place. You just got to work with what's in front of you. Come on, what do you got? You got something. You might not have a degree, but something tells me you still got to hustle. <laughs> you might not have all the contacts that everybody else has, but something tells me you know the one true God, and at any moment, he can show up. I like this part of the story because if you're here and you're very intellectual and you have the Ivy League education, you could read the story and go, that's where I have to pause and stop. I don't know what that smile is, but that's just what I sense, you know? I got to stop there because that is impossible. And those people at Voo Church, they get real hyped up because Rich gets up there and they start clapping and start shouting and they don't even consider what it is that they're reading. There's no way one man could defeat a thousand soldiers. And to that I would say, you're right. But that's the whole point of the story. The whole point of the story is not to destroy your faith, it's to build your faith. Read the Bible. You think it's all logical? How small is your God? Well, I understand him. Uh, I don't always understand God. He always understands me. The whole Bible is stories of impossibilities. Snakes talking, walls falling, Red Seas parting, fish swallowing, heavens opening, giants dying. These are impossible stories but they're not to deter your faith, they're to build your faith. They're to remind you, I don't know what's in front of you today, but when the Spirit of God comes upon you, there is no weapon formed that's big enough to take you out. Oh, I feel like preaching at 12.30 in the afternoon because this is a word for somebody in this house. You better believe that if God stands against you, there is nobody on this earth who can help you. But the flip side is, come on somebody, if God is for you, there is no demon in hell who can stop the work that he wants to accomplish through your life. If God is for me, come on somebody, who can be against me? Me and God are the majority. I don't know what darkness awaits you out there, but I know this, that when God starts fighting your battles, can't nothing stand in your way. Come on, somebody, and give him a big praise today. Give him praise. It's called a supernatural God. And this is called a supernatural, miraculous moment. It requires faith, and faith begins where my ability ends. The story doesn't deter me from God's word. The story builds my faith in a supernatural God. Now, I've preached parts of Samson's story, particularly this one, because this is what we call low-hanging fruit to preachers. 
because everybody likes to clap about, I don't know what stands in your way, but if God be for you, who can be against you? That, that, that'll, that'll make an atheist clap, you know? And this is a very true statement, but there's something at play here that I think many of us miss because that's not exactly how the text is fully to be preached. Notice in Judges chapter 14, we'll start back at 13, he's called by God to be the deliverer of the Israelites, but he's also commanded. And every one of us who have a call also have a command. Every one of us who have a vision, we also have to have values. Every one of us who have a duty, we also have to have discipline. With great authority comes great accountability. He had a Nazarite vow, there's three parts of the Nazarite vow. Can't drink alcohol, can't touch something dead, can't cut your hair. In Judges 14 alone, he has broken two parts of the Nazarite vow. It comes into 16 that he cuts his hair. I'm gonna preach about it in the next few weeks. But right here, he's doing it again. Samson reaches out for something that God has already forbidden him to touch. The the fresh donkey's jawbone is something that's dead. It's a hollow bone. It's an empty wind. And he reaches for the jawbone, and as he does, he breaks his vow another time. To which you might be saying, well, why on earth did God give him the victory? Is this just a one-off? No, this is biblical. This is Romans chapter 11, verse 29. Watch this. For God's gifts and his, what's the word? For God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. I grew up in like church, church. I love our church. Sometimes I wish you were a little bit more churchy, but that's okay. That's okay. It's a new church. I get it. Um. But I I learned this passage that God's gifts are without repentance. So let me try to paraphrase that or let me try to translate that for you so how that can make sense. That means that you can be gifted greatly and still be sinning terribly. I'm confused, Rich, that doesn't make any sense to me. It's because a gift is something that you cannot earn. You can't pay for a gift. All of God's gifts that he gives us, his anointing, his touch, his favor, it's not based on our worthiness. It's based on his kindness. But do not be so immature to believe that anybody and everybody who does something that has God show up is an approval from God. Sometimes we do things and God, who's rich in mercy, still accomplishes his plan, still shows up, but just because God showed up does not mean he approves of the means of how we got there. One of my sons, I won't tell you who, (laughs) but one of my sons has been getting cold hard cash around the house and he's been going to school to which he has found the snack shack and money talks, <laughs> even from a four-year-old. And he's buying lollipops. And we don't make our kids take a Nazarite vow, but um, we do have sugar regulations on our children. And we found his backpack with lollipops. <laughs> Teachers are saying he's in the stalls. And we said, son, how did you get these? He said, you gave me a dollar. I said, that's true. (laughs) But just because you have the ability does not mean that you have the authority. Just because I can doesn't mean I should. Just because God moved does not mean that he approves of the moment. We have to be very, very careful that we don't allow our gifts to take us to a place that our character cannot keep us. Because greater than the gifts is the fruit. But the fruit is something that comes from the heart. The fruit is not goosebumps and altar calls and powerful preaching. That's the gift. That's the anointing. But when I only operate in anointing and I never get back to the basics of doing it from the right motivation of the heart, it will always leave me empty. Because look at Samson, bro. Samson slaughters him and just shows you, watch this, 
the condition of his heart. This is Judges chapter 15, verse 16. Then Samson said, many theologians believe this is a song. With a donkey's jawbone, I've made donkeys of them. That was me attempting to sing and you didn't laugh. All right. With a donkey's jawbone, I've killed a thousand men. With a donkey's jawbone, I've made a donkey's of them. With a donkey's jawbone, I've killed a thousand men. With a donkey's jawbone, I've made donkeys of them. With a donkey's jawbone, I've killed a thousand men. Models and bottles, models and bottles. Don't get religious on me, chill out. <laughs> just just see, see how hysterical this is. He has just slaughtered a thousand men. And as he finishes slaughtering a thousand men, he lifts up a jawbone. And the thing he decides to give credit and glory to is the jawbone. Listen to me. The moment that you give more credit to the donkey than to God is when you have a thing called misplaced praise. The irony. You know what Judah means? 3,000 men from Judah? Judah means praise. And instead of praising God with the tribe of Judah, my man lifts up the jawbone and sings a song of praise to the donkey's jawbone. It was Jesus who came into Jerusalem riding on a donkey and people praised Jesus saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Nobody was praising the donkey. God used the donkey to give glory to Jesus. And the least that Samson could have done is Samson could have at least used the donkey's jawbone to give glory to God. But don't let this be a lesson about Samson. Look at your own life. How many times do we have misplaced praise? How many times do we give glory to all the stuff that it wasn't actually about? How many times do we give credit to our education? God bless your education, but God just used that education to get glory through it. It was a donkey, somebody. God bless your great personality. We love your personality. But you keep thanking your personality, you ought to thank the one who gave you the personality. Some of you are grateful for all your good business deals and all your money. I'm grateful for money, but money's a tool. Money's an instrument. Without God, it's just a donkey. I'm gonna use the money, come on somebody, to give glory to God. And you gotta see this because when you keep going it, I gotta have it my way, watch this. This is important. When you take authority that's not yours, you will steal glory that's not yours. When you take authority that's not yours, when you keep crossing the boundary, the only result ultimately will be, God, I'm gonna take that glory from me. And the problem with that is, is that you can't handle God's glory. You can't live up to it. You can't carry it. It's too heavy. It's too big for you. It will crush you. It will deplete you. It will ruin you. And any area of misplaced praise will always lead to some form of malnourishment. Because here's Samson, the man who is winning on the outside. But watch now as he finds himself after the battle. This is Judges 15, verse 18. We come to a close. Because he was very thirsty, he cried out to the Lord, you have given your servants this great victory. Must I now die of thirst and fall into the hands of the uncircumcised? Then God opened up the hollow place. If you got your Bible, I want you to underline that word, hollow place. This is a dry place in Lehi, and water came out of it. When Samson drank, his strength returned, and he was revived. So the spring was called en Hakor, and it's still there in Lehi. Samson led Israel for 20 years in the days of the Philistines. Remember, chapter 14 ends with his anger burning him up. And now he stepped into 15, doing whatever he's wanted to do, not checking in on it, not addressing it, not managing it. And now he's burned through everything. And like a forest fire, when a fire comes through a forest, what is the result? Everything becomes barren and dry. And now here's this big man full of strength. And he's on the verge of saying, God, take my life. 
I'm so thirsty. I need you to show up. He's winning, but he's still empty. My friend Stephen Furtick, who I love so much, he says it this way. He says, when your val values become shallow, your victories become empty. He has not operated from a value system of God. He's chosen vengeance instead of forgiveness. He's chosen isolation instead of community. He's chosen resentment instead of love. And so it is with all of us in this place. When our values become shallow, materialism, greed, selfishness, flesh, projection. It doesn't matter how many wins we get on the outside. It doesn't matter if we get it our way. We will only wind up saying, my way is the wrong way. I'm winning, but I'm still empty. I'm winning according to everyone else around me, but why is it that I go to bed every night still thirsty, not satisfied, not fulfilled. See, I love the story of Samson because all four chapters over and over and over again, we see the grace of God at work. Because long before Jesus even gets on the scene, the character of God is that he's slow to anger, he's rich in mercy, he doesn't want anyone to perish, and he keeps giving Samson time and time again to repent. So much so that from this dry place, after he's broken his vow multiple times, he cries out to God. And when he cries out to God from the dry place, from the barren place, from the hollow place, from the empty place, springs forth water and God meets his need as he humbles himself and cries out. And if it's true for Samson, it's true for you. But many of us, the reality is, is that we don't want to face ourselves. Samson's real enemy is not the Philistines. It's himself. We just preach to you now. Spirit of God's here. Let the gift come on to you right now. Just receive it. Some of you are creating enemies because you'd rather spend your time over there instead of dealing with you. You want to make up all sorts of stuff. You want to create all sorts of things. Well, if they would do this, if she would do that, if dad would have done this, if my boss would have said that. No, 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 friend. You're in a hollow place. And you will never change that which you cannot confront. You got to face you. You got to face the fact that you're in this position is because you keep making dumb decisions kind of like at two in the morning, getting off of US-1 and going through the drive-thru. It's leaving you empty. It's, it's killing you from the inside out. But look at the mercy of God. Out of the dry place, after all of these disqualifying acts, after all of these things that was not the approval of God, God says, I will meet your need. It's not just in the story of Samson, but it's the New Testament. It's Jesus. Jesus is in a town, and one day he comes up in the middle of the day. It's John chapter 4, and there's a woman, and she's drawing water. The reason why she's drawing water is because she has sin and shame, and she's not proud of who she is. So she's not going in the morning when the sun's down. Instead, she's out in the baking hot, burning sun. And some of you are burning today because you're trying to solve your problem, and you're trying to fulfill your thirst in your own merit, in your own effort. And Jesus walks up and she says to the man, hey, do you want me to draw you some water? I love Jesus. He's like, girl, if you knew who you were talking to, you would ask me for water. Because woman, you've already been married five times. You did what you wanted. In fact, you're with another dude right now and that's not even your husband. Girl, I think you're thirsty. I think you're thirsty because all six men could not meet your need. But today, in the burning hot sun, I don't believe you're dry yet. I'm the seventh man. And seven is the number of completion. 
Seven is the number of satisfaction. And Jesus says, if you'll drink of me, watch this, you will never thirst again. So what am I supposed to do in the hollow place? You're supposed to cry out. I'm dry again. Someone told you that following Jesus was a one-time decision. I don't know who taught you that. I don't like criticizing churches or we're all working, but I'm just telling you, it's not a one-time decision. It's a daily decision. And when Jesus says, drink of me, he's saying, you got to keep drinking of me. Because I'm not just the water, I am the well. And next time you get thirsty, you know where to come back and find living water, water that satisfies, water that fulfills. That you would be victorious and satisfied. That you would be accomplished and fulfilled. That you would be powerful and obedient. That you would have the gifts and the fruit. That you would have the vision, but my goodness, you'd be driven with the values. I know why I'm doing it. I know how I'm doing it. I know who I'm doing it for. Because the question has to be asked. I know it's Sunday afternoon in August and you got a lot of stuff going on, but man, this is the real stuff we got to address and it's Jesus's question. And the question comes from Mark chapter eight. He says it this way, for what does it profit a man to win? What's it profit a woman to gain the whole world but leave you empty? What's, what's the point of winning if you're still empty? What's the point of accomplishing if you're not fulfilled? What's the point of gaining the whole world yet forfeiting your soul? And we don't come here to do exterior work. We don't come here to play church. We come here because there is a God who created you, formed you and fashioned you, called you, purposed you, has a plan for your life. There is a you that's realer than any of us can see right now. It's the soul you. And Jesus came to save that, to redeem that, and then to put that into motion for his glory and his glory alone. And the very fact that you're here right now tells me he's not done with you. You're not dead, it means he's not done. But Rich, I've made bad mistakes and I've done really dumb things and I'm carrying shame. You're up there making jokes about McDonald's. Bro, that does not relate to me because I've done some real things that cause shame. Oh, but friend, he's the God that if you'll humble yourself, He's the God that if you're still breathing, it's because he's still working. He's the God who says, even in the burning hot sun, you don't have to be dry today because I have living water. Call upon me and I will save your soul and I will satisfy your soul and I will fulfill you. That's who I am. And that's what I can do. He loves you and he loves Samson and he loves us. And today, we can humble ourselves and we can walk in his way. My way, it ain't working. My way is the wrong way. But Jesus said, I am the way and I am the truth. If anyone wants to find that fulfillment and get to heaven, you gotta come through me. Repent, be baptized, follow Jesus. He loves you and he has a plan for you. Come on, if you believe in all of our locations, can we just give God glory? Hallelujah. Hey, this is Rich and Don Sheree Wilkerson, and we want to say thank you so much for watching and engaging with today's content. Maybe today you want to make the decision to follow Jesus. Why don't you pray this prayer with me? Dear Jesus, today I choose to entrust my life to you. Forgive me of my sins. Make me a new creation. I love you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're celebrating with you the decision that you've made, and we wanna walk this journey out alongside you. Yeah, and if you just prayed that prayer, why don't you go ahead and follow the prompts that are on the screen right now. We're so glad that you took some time to watch today's message. Do us a favor, if it encouraged you, if it impacted you, go ahead and share this. And if you haven't already, go ahead and subscribe to the Voo Church YouTube channel so you can continue to get more content like this. We love you guys, and we're declaring the best is yet to, to come. come.